Hello and welcome to this edition of Tech24. You thought dinosaurs disappeared when a space rock hit the Yucatan region some 66 million years ago? Well, think again. The impact did indeed doom them, but research now suggests they were already going extinct. We speak about this groundbreaking discovery with the co-author of the study, Fabien Condani. And in Test 24, we'll have a look at how far underwater drones have come from ones that pilot themselves to one that anyone can pilot from home. The source code for the World Wide Web has been auctioned off at Sotheby's in New York for $5.4 million in the form of an NFT. The program paved the way for the internet as we know it today. Luke Schrago takes a dive into the digital ether to explain more. 30 years after its creation, the source code written by inventor Tim Berners-Lee for what was to become the internet has been sold at auction for $5.4 million as a non-fungible token. But that doesn't mean the internet itself has been sold, so let's back up. What exactly is an NFT? You need to think uh, digitally is a digital source of both authenticity and also an uh, authenticity around ownership. So the owner of this work will absolutely fundamentally be buying something that's come from Sir Tim, is authenticated as being from Sir Tim, but equally is uniquely their own and of course their ownership will be recorded in the blockchain as well. The blockchain underpins the cryptocurrency medium in which NFT transactions are made. It's hard to overestimate the impact the creation of the World Wide Web had on the planet. Its inventor Berners-Lee wanted it to spread, so rather than patenting the code, left it open source, available to all. I wanted something which was both a way of tracking information, but also a form of communication. So one of the goals was I could use it to collaborate with people I worked with. Beyond the 10,000 lines of code that idea led to, the auction's winner picked up an animated visualization, a digital poster and letter written by Berners-Lee himself. It's just the latest in a series of sales by an auction house of pieces that don't exist in a physical form. I think actually what you're seeing actually certainly since the beginning of 2021 as the auction houses and particularly Sotheby's have got into the NFT market, it's really a leg legitimization I think of this space. It's not hard to see why auction houses are interested in that space. An NFT went under the hammer at Christie's in March for a record $70 million. Now, we all know that some 66 million years ago, a six-mile-wide space rock hit the Yucatan region, wiping dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. But would they have survived without it? While new breaking ground research suggests otherwise, scientists at the Institute of Evolutionary Science in Montpellier have studied 1,600 fossils from 247 dinosaur species that lived during the late Cretaceous uh, period, and they found that some dinosaurs had already started to go extinct before the impact occurred. Well, let's cross over to the co-author of this report, Fabien Condanim. Hello and welcome. Hello, Julia. Thank you for having me. So tell us more about how you conducted your study and what it is you discovered. Well, we have studied the final periods of dinosaur evolution. And we wanted to test the hypothesis that a sudden extinction due to the meteorite impact caused their final extinction 66 million years ago. And we wanted to investigate whether there was like a gradual decline also. And for that, we analyzed the fossil record for six dinosaurs families that are well representative of the late Cretaceous. And we found about 250 species for which we compiled all the fossil material that can be attributed for each species. And this provided uh, the raw data to estimate the ages of species origin and species extinction, which, is, which then allows us to estimate the accumulation of the number of species through time. And we found that the number of dinosaur species was more elevated 76 million years ago than 66 million years ago. So we found some evidence for 10 million years decline, which is likely due to the increase of extinction starting about 76 million years ago. So what actually caused dinosaurs to start going extinct then? Uh, and to find the likely reasons explaining this decline, we modeled the rates of species diversification and extinction, and their correlation to 10 selected variables, such as temperature and sea level, for instance. And we found that the increase of extinction in the last 10 million years 
can be probably attributed to a continuous global cooling and also to a drop in the number of herbivore species. And it is important to remind that the Cretaceous period is a very warm period and that this cooling is important so that we observed a 7 to 10 de degrees decrease of temperature globally. And for dinosaurs, such a decline represents an environmental deterioration. Uh, these animals are mesothermic, so they rely in part on the external temperature of the environment, and this cooling may have slowed down all their activity and biological activities. So the second uh, reason is the drop of herbivores, which makes sense ecologically speaking, since herbivores are often considered as key species in any ecosystems, even today, such as Africa savanna, for instance. And the removal of herbivores in the Cretaceous have probably made all ecosystems very unstable and then uh, prone to extinctions in, in, in cascades, so that the, all the, the, the the carnivores, for instance, which depend on the herbivores, could have declined, declined after the extinction of uh, the herbivores. Well, Fabien Condanim, thank you very much for speaking to us here on Tech24. It was truly a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Let's now welcome Peter O'Brien, our tech editor. Hello, Peter. Hello, Julia. Now, we've seen with uh, Fabian, of course, that science is all about revisiting uh, past beliefs, but also challenging all of the variables almost constantly. And it's true, of course, for dinosaurs, but it's also true for o our own species. In fact, Charles Darwin, we all know him, of course, because of Darwinism, uh, may not have had all of the answers. Yeah, well, let's start with giving some credit where credit's due. A lot of his main ideas, so the fact that life is all related, that a species change is the result of natural selection and that new forms replace those that came before. They all still hold true today. And besides, he was a humble man. He never actually claimed to have all of the answers he actually wrote in Origin of the Species. In the distant future, I see open fields for far more important researchers. Well, one of those fields has been the study of human fossils, and there weren't many at all when he was around, but now we have access to hundreds of them dating back seven million years. That's dozens of species. Some of, of them are our ancestors, some distant cousins. Now, the main thing, of course, to remember is that this idea of a missing link, the kind of evolution that you see depicted on t-shirts or stickers, cartoons, this is outdated and actually a misinterpretation of Darwin himself. He never claimed that we were descended in a linear manner from another existing species of ape. We just share common ancestors. The amazing thing, though, is with all of these experiments in human life that there have been over the course of evolution, well, all of them have ended in mass ex extinction of those, those species, apart from one, and that's us. Well, so far, at least. All right. Now, if evolution isn't linear, then how do scientists actually see it? Yeah, so they map it out using models called a tree of life. It looks a bit like this. And to give it its, its scientific name, it's the phylogenetic tree. So you can see over here on the top left, that's us Homo sapiens. And on the right here, you can see the pan genus. So that includes the bonobo and the chimpanzee. And we're not directly descended from them, as you can see, even though we're their closest relatives, we actually come from this same ancestor. Um, now, scientists have been trying to track these kind of trees all, all the way back to what's known as the LUCA, which is the last universal common ancestor. That's the organism where all life on Earth currently is descended. Now, how do they actually go back in time like this and so far back too? Yeah, so there's no fossil evidence for the LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. It's just too old. But the puzzle, the genetic puzzle can be pieced together through what we know from living organisms today. You can see a few of them here. You can recognize some animals, fungi. All of them come back to this LUCA. What's more difficult to take into account, though, is horizontal gene transfer. And that's when genetic material is passed from organism to organism without reproduction. So one example is the spread of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. That's an example of horizontal gene transfer. In this sense, scientists are starting to see the tree of life as more of a network than a tree, at least with the smallest organisms. Well, thank you, Peter, for shedding light, a little bit more light, at least, on our origin. We're going to move on now to Test24.
This week on Test 24, we're talking about ROVs, remotely operated underwater vehicles. They have all sorts of uses, let it be mine sweeping, surveying, collecting scientific samples, and even filming documentaries. So what do they actually look like, Peter? Well, let me introduce you to the first one ever built. It was built in the 1950s by the Royal Navy and was used up until the 80s for getting rid of used mines and torpedoes that were part of testing. Um, and we've come pretty far since this massive machine Definitely. here. This one here is called Bentix, and it was knocked up by Nicola Borsino, who is an engineering student in the university, engineering university there is at Lille. Um, now, this one is a 3D printed underwater drone that's going to be attached with a uh, claw for picking up plastic and cleaning the seas. Amazingly, Nicola only got his hands on a 3D printer a year ago. So we can see how previously high specialist equipment has been now democratized. Yes, and not only can just an engineering student knock up their own fully functional drone, but we can all have a go piloting them now thanks to Ender Drone, which is a um, which is a pilot project um, which is currently in development, which is outsourcing the control of its fleet of ROVs to be used for litter picking along the coastline. So anyone can sign up online to this scheme. You can learn the controls and then participate in a big ocean cleanup mission, controlling the drone live from your home. That's very impressive. Let's talk about the second drone that we have here on the set of Test 24. It looks like it's a little bit more high tech. Yes, perhaps. this is more complex. This is the CSAM made by the uh, Marseille company Nautilo Plus, and it can function as an ROV, but also as a an autonomous robot as well. So it can perform complex operations all on its own, like hull, hull um, inspections, leak detection, it can use sonar and vision tech to avoid obstacles. It can follow the walls, say, on the, on the hull of a boat and remain stable in the sea. And it uses AI to detect anomalies and flag up when structures might need repair and maintenance. Thank you very much, Peter. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech 24. See you soon.